it. Sorry about that. There's lots of different ways to, uh, to deliver messages. Sometimes you can tell a story and uh, you invite people to jump into the thought or the process of Scripture through storytelling. Uh, sometimes you, uh, you kind of take some words in Scripture and you look at them from the Old Testament and the New Testament and you, you compare the different, uh, different ways that, that Scripture has brought those out. And then sometimes we sit and we look at one passage of Scripture and it's more of a teaching than it is a message. And this morning, that's the kind of message and that's the kind of uh, 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 preaching that I want to do. It's, it's more of a teaching this morning. And we're going to look at just one passage of Scripture and we're going to just kind of dive down verse by verse and we're going to work our way through a chapter of Scripture. And that chapter is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. And we're going to talk about love this morning, but probably a little bit differently in a little bit different context than, than maybe what uh, first might pop into your mind. And so I'm just going to put up uh, this, this plaque, this word that says love. And um, as you know, we have been working through since the 1st of January uh, different things that are biblical part of a description of a Christ follower. And we started the 1st of, of January talking about justice and mercy and deeds and we went to our heart and about how God is worthy and about how he expects us to follow him, about how we're to seek him, about how we're to give of our time and our, our talents and, and, and our offering, how we're to surrender to him, how we're to be active, how we're to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And now today we come to love. And you see we're kind of getting down to the bottom of the cross. That's because Easter's coming and we're going to celebrate all of these things on, uh, on Easter Sunday morning. But I want to give you an introduction to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 by, by telling you a little bit about the culture in which this chapter was written to. This is a, a chapter out of Scripture that was written to a community that happened to be a large city. And this city was kind of the hub of, of international commerce. I mean, it would be like San Francisco or it would be like Boston where ships come in from all over the world and they carry their cargo and they come into port and they're offloaded and literally there's people of every culture and there's people of every place on the face of the earth that get intersected in these large ports where commerce is exchanged and then after those ships are offloaded, the products that were produced in Corinth were then loaded on the ships and they went back to where they came and, and they went back and forth and back and forth. And as a result of this commerce that happened in the city of Corinth, it was an intersection of cultures. It was also an intersection of kind of the underside of humanity as well. It was, the, in that day, it was the center of the sex slave trade industry. It was the center of prostitution. It was the center of all of those kind of activities. Uh, this city happened to be kind of the epicenter of religiosity as well. It was the center of all the world religions coming together and intersecting and people making judgments and people saying, well, I like that part of that religion and I like that part of that religion and I like this part of that religion and I'll blend it all together and that'll be God for me. I mean, it was kind of this blending of everything. Um, it was also a city where where there was a lot of corruption in the political system, where um, politicians were paid off and politicians were bribed and politicians were given donations and politicians would do things to serve just the, the immediate needs around them. I mean, it was a city that had all of these mixed influences all kind of piled on and together. Does that city sound anything like our society today? I mean, just kind of maybe a little bit, okay? I mean, I had Gail go out on the internet this week and just pull some headlines that, that happened this week and we're going to show them on a, on a screen here and, and, and go ahead, Todd, to that next, uh, that next slide. And all of these things that, that pop right out of our news would describe the city of Corinth. So, so the setting of the city of Corinth and the setting of our culture today, I mean, they're parallel and God knew that. I mean, when God gave Paul these words, he knew that, that humankind was humankind and sin was sin and truth was truth. And, and those kind of things were eternal. It didn't matter if it was the first century or if it was today that those kind of things that we would have to grapple with. Also knew about the church and, and some of the same things that the church was struggling with in the city of Corinth, the church struggles with today. The church in Corinth was actually planted by Paul, and you can read about how he planted the church in Acts chapter 18. We're not going to go there this morning, but you can read about it. And the church was planted by him, so he was coming back to this church plant, and he was coming back to a church that, 
had kind of gotten their eyes off of the cross and gotten their eyes off of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, many of these things they were choosing to ignore or they'd rationalized out of their lives. I mean, you can read the rest of Corinthians and, and Paul's letter to them to see how some of these things they were struggling with. And so we get down to chapter 13. And Paul is giving them a message about being a follower of Christ, about being a church, about what church is and what church is not. And, and he's giving these examples. And he, he, he gives this teaching to the church. And that's why I say this morning, I'm going to teach rather than preach because I think that we need to hear this teaching because it wasn't just for the church in Corinth. It's for the church today. It's for us as well. And so if you have your Bibles, you can dive in. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. If you don't, the, the words are going to be on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, we read those words, and probably if you've been around the church any length of time, you've heard those words, I mean, so many times, even though you didn't really have them memorized when I just read this, you said, oh yeah, I remember that verse, okay? I, I remember that. I know that one, okay? And we almost see this. I mean, this is almost eloquent language. I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I mean, it's got that kind of, you know, flow to it. But if we were really in the church in the first century when when, when the apostle came back to the church that he planted and he would stand in our midst and he said, you know what? If you speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, then I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He was literally almost insulting the people that were there. He was calling them a name. He was calling the church a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And so Paul was coming into their midst and he was stirring them up and he was doing it intentionally. It wasn't this poetic language. It was kind of in your face. It was kind of right there. It was kind of like, folks, we need to deal with this issue because we're not being the church the way the church is to be the church. And then Paul went on and in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, he starts, and if I... now. Now, when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, Todd, you can go to the next uh, section there. It says, if I, um, he, he starts out very personal. And all of these things that he lists, the church knows him as having these qualities. For instance, he says, if I have prophetic powers. They saw him as a person who could help guide the church and who could say, hey, you guys got to be watching out because this is going to happen and this is going to come. And, and so when Paul said, you know what, if I have prophetic powers, they were saying, yep, yeah, that's, we, we, we agree. If, if Paul had that, yeah, he's got that. And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. They saw him as a person who was their guide. He was their leader. He was the church leader of the time. So they saw him as a person with knowledge and they saw him as a person that understood all kinds of things and all kinds of culture because of his travels. And the implication of Corinth being this world city, they knew that Paul understood this. So Paul was saying qualities in a very personal way that if you were in the congregation in that first century, you would have been sitting there going, okay, I agree, I agree, yep, you, you do. I mean, this, is, this rings true to me that you are this type of person. And he goes on, and if I have all faith is to remove mountains. I mean, they knew that he was a man of faith. They'd heard him tell his stories. They'd heard him tell his stories of Roman government stories and of God's stories and of, of, of transition stories and of healing stories and all those kind of things. They knew that they weren't just stories, but they were events that God had done through him, and he was a great man of faith. So they would have said, yes, you are this kind of person. And then he says, but... But if I have not love, I'm nothing. And so they're looking at Paul as this great leader, this person that has all kinds of faith, that can move mountains, that has knowledge, that has wisdom, that has prophetic power. And then he says, but if I, as a person, if I, as your leader, if I don't have love, then you know what? Then I'm nothing. And then he gives some very practical examples that the church then could understand and the church today can understand and get their mind around. He says, if I give away all that I have. Now we've talked about service projects. We can serve the, the community and we can help pack the, the weekend lunches on Thursday and then deliver them to Sasha Ball Elementary or Pine Knob Elementary. And we can take those lunches into the schools. 
We can, we can serve in Pontiac. We can serve at my brother's keeper in Flint. You can go on the mission trip this summer to Oakdale Christian High School down in the, the hills of Kentucky. You can, you can go to Kenya. You can go to India. You can serve. You can do all these things. You can do all this stuff. If you don't have love, it's, it, it's nothing. If I deliver up my body to be burned, if I sacrifice who I am, if I allow myself to be killed by these oppressors, but I have not love, I gain nothing. You see, Paul was giving a very personal account, a very personal deal to say, you know what? The most important thing that we have on this whole deal of following Jesus, the most important deal is this deal called love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in, in verse 4, there's a whole shift that happens in this passage, okay? There's this I, 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 okay? If I have prophetic powers, if I do this, if I do this. Look at verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 4. Todd, can you go to 13, 4? All of a sudden, do you see any eyes? I mean, just look at the screen a minute. Do you see any eyes in these three verses, four verses, okay? The eyes are gone, aren't they? It's no longer about Paul. There's a shift that takes place, and all of a sudden, there's this thing, love, and there's this description of love. So there's something that's changed in Scripture. There's something that's changed in the Word. There's some emphasis that's, that's it's different. And many biblical scholars say these verses out of 1 Corinthians 13, these verses are actually talking about the very nature and the very person of Christ. And, and, and so as we think about serving Christ and we say, well, hold it, here's a description of this one whom we serve, all of a sudden, instead of love being at the bottom, all of a sudden, love has to be at the top, and actually, next week, it will be, but justice kept falling off, so I had to screw it down, okay? <laughs> so I couldn't move it, all right? So you picture that I just moved the two, okay? And, and, and love has to be at the top, and, and all of a sudden, we're getting a, a description of the person that has all of these qualities that we follow as a Christ follower. Now look what he says. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful it does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Now, we're going to stop right there, and we're going to continue. We're going to leave this up. We're going to stop right there because I want to pick up on something that happens at that next but word there in verse 6. But this whole beginning describes what love is. And when I read this, I am incredibly convicted because I look at this and I say, man, I'm not patient, okay? Sometimes I might tend to be a little rude, Quite frankly, I like it my way because I think my way is always better, okay? I mean, um, irritable or resentful, sometimes I get irritable. I mean, probably the people that see that most are my family. I mean, when I read this list, I'm, I'm incredibly convicted. And this is about Paul telling the church, this is what I should be. This is what we should be. This is the, the character that we should strive for I mean, when I read that, I say, that has to be Christ because a human being cannot be that perfect. And Christ is the perfect one. And so I have to, implement, I have to try to implement that. You know, I heard a really sad story this morning. Carrie and Kyle stopped at Tim Hortons this morning. And the um, sad part was they didn't bring me a donut, but... Anyway, they, they, no, that really wasn't the sad part. They stopped at Tim Hortons to get, I don't know, coffee or donut or whatever. And Carrie was in the restaurant, and, and, and she went in, and uh, um, she, she was there in the restaurant, and she overheard one worker saying to another that their ovens had broken, and it would be four hours before they got fixed, and they didn't have any donuts. And it's Sunday morning, and she says, you know what the worst part about this is? Our ovens broke down on Sunday morning, and we're going to have to deal with all those church people. Somebody out in the community, the worst part about the ovens is we're going to have to deal with all the church people that don't have their donuts. Love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. That's when it hits really close. When, when we understand that Paul was, was telling the church, this isn't just flippant stuff. I mean, this is important stuff. And then it, there's a but there, and it, it changes from all the stuff that love shouldn't be. Now in verse 6, right in the middle, it changes to what love should be, okay? But it rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. In other words, it, it's compassionate, and it has a little bit of patience, and it's not quite so irritable. And it believes all things, and it hopes all things. It actually believes that we can be people of justice and mercy and deed and worship a worthy God and have a heart that's surrendered and seek him and expect him and we can give to him and we can surrender and we can be active and we can be filled. It actually believes that we can do those things because we're called to do those things as Christ followers. And it endures all things. See, Paul has made a shift. And he's given us the example of Christ in this whole love deal and he's told us what it does and what it doesn't do. And then let's go down to verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Love never ends. Okay, it's endless. It doesn't begin and end. It's, it's not a program. I mean, we'll have programs of the church that'll start and stop. We'll have stuff that'll begin and end. We'll have colors of carpet that come in and they go. And we'll have buildings that come and go. And we'll have all kinds of stuff. But love never ends. It's always consistent. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. Your life, my life, we're going to live. Hopefully, we're going to be a Christ follower and work for Christ. And then we're going to die. I mean, that's life. That's life and death. That's the process. As for knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, Paul is saying, you know what, we together, we think we know and we think we understand and we think we prophesy and we do our best and all of these things. But when perfect comes, a partial will pass away. When Christ comes, when this perfect love is in our midst, all those things, we're going to realize that the most important thing of all of this stuff is this love. You know, I've asked Gail and Laura to do some projects recently on looking up old minutes from the Clarkston Free Methodist Church. And uh, I gave Gail an assignment this week. I said, can you look at the old minutes and look back at, you know, stuff 10, 15 years ago and give me something that was really controversial at the time that everybody was all kind of, I don't know, hot under the collar about and stuff? She said, sure. You know, it sounded like an exciting experiment for her, I guess. So she got looking, and she gave me all of these minutes that have to do with one thing in 2001. Now, I don't know how many of you were here in 2001, but this was pretty fascinating reading, and I've heard some stories from some other people about this. But you know what? Today, I mentioned this first service, and there was a bunch of people there that were here in 2001. They didn't even remember it, okay? It was about changing the name of the board and restructuring the board to be a little bit different, okay? I mean, it happened 13 years ago. I mean, today, it's like, so what? Okay, knowledge, pass away. Sometimes we think stuff and we think things are so important. But the most important thing is our love for one another and our love for Christ. You know, next week we're going to come together as a church and, and we're going to take a vote on whether we're going to relocate or whether we're not going to relocate and all that kind of stuff. And people have asked me, what do you think? And I said, you know what? I want God to guide. And whatever the result is, we're going to put together a plan to reach our community for Christ. And you know what? Ten years from now, no matter what decision is made, we're going to look back and see all the things that God has done and blessed us with. And if our main goal is love, then we've done the right thing. Love one another and love Christ. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. That's what this whole deal of being a Christ follower is about. It's not about everything else. It's about loving Jesus and loving others. Pastor Chris, I always pick on you. Can I pick on you again? No. Please, come on. <laughs> come on up, okay? Okay. Pastor Chris. I need somebody really good looking that can be a model. 
All right, see? Wasn't I nice this morning? Yeah, I'm okay. Waiting for the other shoe to drop. No, can you hold that? What does this say? That's the whole deal of being a Christ follower. If we don't do that, let me slip into Paul's role, then we're not a Christ follower. Everything begins and ends with love. Every other thing in life will pass away. Our knowledge, our prophecies, our buildings, our lives. But what will last is love. And Paul tells us we need to embrace that as Christ followers. We need to embrace it in our body. We need to really learn how to love one another. And sometimes that's hard. It's hard to love people in my own home sometimes. I won't mention any names because some of them are here this morning. Um, <laughs> but let alone in the church sometimes, you know. But God has called us to love one another. And the primary goal is love. So we're given a command. We're given an expectation. How do we, as Christ followers, embrace that expectation? I think we need to embrace it full bore. I think we need to say, yes, this is how we want to live. We want to love one another. Thanks, Chris. See, that wasn't hard, was it? Anytime. All right. OK. You did a wonderful job. And, and, and next week, that'll be up on the cross as well. OK? You know, when I think about that, I, I gave you the example from Clarkston. Let me give you an example from, um, I, I went into my first church in Clio. And I was excited because I was a youth pastor. And this is the first time that I was going to be a lead pastor. OK, that means a senior pastor in a church. Now, this church was really small. And understand, I was not only the lead pastor, I was the music pastor, I was the youth pastor, I was everything because we didn't have any. I was it, OK? And there was about 60 adults. And I came in, and I was all excited. And I gave my first Sunday's message. And I was really excited about preaching for the very first time. And right after the message, a guy came up to me and just laid into me. And you know what the critical thing that he laid into me about was? The ceiling fans, OK? Because there had been an ongoing five-year discussion about the ceiling fans. And you know what it was? Should we run them during service or should we not? And he wanted to know my opinion, whether I would run them during service or whether I wouldn't run them during service. We eventually solved that problem. We got air conditioning. But um, <laughs> you know, we had that problem. And it's so important. But it's so small. And Paul was telling the church in Corinth, let's not be small. Let's not be the church that Tim Horton talks about and says, oh, no, our ovens are down. And it's Sunday morning. It's awful. Worst day in the week they could have broken down was on Sunday when all the church people are going to be in. Let's not be like that. Let's not be the people that focus on non-eternal issues. People that focus on stuff that will pass away. Let's focus on the important stuff, the stuff that God has called us to, justice and mercy and heart and seeking and giving and surrendering and being filled. But most of all, let's focus on love, loving of Christ and loving one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Paul switches back now. He comes back to the personal. He comes back to, hey, this is, this is about Paul now. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. In other words, he's giving him a message. He's saying, don't think in selfish ways. Don't think in all those irritable ways. Don't think in those ways it's me first. Think in those ways that it's love-centered. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. He's referring to, for now, we can look at all these things that describe Christ. And they're in the Bible. They're in the Old Testament. They're in the New Testament. We've gone through all of these things since the 1st of January. And we see Christ. But it's still dimly. Someday, we're going to look Christ face to face. And today, this morning, we talk about the love of Christ. And we talk about the love of the body that we're to have. And we kind of get a feeling for what that needs to look like. But someday, we'll be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And it won't be on a cross on pieces of wood that's been, been written with paint. It'll be in the very nature of the presence of Jesus Christ, and we'll see it clearly. Then I shall be known fully as I have been fully known. And then 1 Corinthians 13, the verse that we all know from the chapter. So now faith and hope and love abide. 
I mean, Paul, again, he's a man of faith. He's a man of hope. He's a man of love. They abide. They're in him. They're in the church. All of these things, but these three. The greatest of these is what? What is it? Love. It's tough. It's hard. It means we embrace one another. It means we embrace Jesus Christ. And it means that we take our life and we lay it down and we say, Jesus, I love you so much. Take my life. Use it. Have it. Jesus, I love you so much that I'm going to embrace those people I worship with. Jesus, I love you so much that I'm going to embrace the cause of the Christ, the cause of a Christ follower. Jesus, I love you so much that this is going to be my life, not how I have defined my life. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's our description. It's our life. It's our epitaph. It's, it's our everything. It's Christ in us. Now, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song about God's love for us. And it's a simple chorus. You've already sung it. You sang it just before the message, and then we're going to turn around and sing it after the message. But as we sing this, I want you to sing it as a prayer to God, as acknowledging this Jesus who's loved you so much that he's died on a cross and he's given his life so that we can give our life for one another as well. Let me pray for you. Lord, you've taught us this morning out of your word. And God, you've given us an expectation. As this expectation was given to the church in Corinth, it wasn't given and it wasn't put in your word for one church at one point in time in history in one location at a point on the globe. Lord Jesus, this letter, this admonition from Paul to your church in Corinth, God, it's there for us today. It'll be there for our children tomorrow. It'll be there for our children's children. Lord Jesus, it's for us to grab hold of, to embrace. God, help us to fully love you. God, help us to embrace you with everything we have, to surrender our life, to be willing to give and to be filled by you. And Jesus, help us to love one another. Help us to be the church and the community that while Tim Hortons may say, I hate to have church people come, it's all right if a few of those Clarkston Free Methodist Church people come because they'll love us anyway. Lord, help that love to permeate through our ministry, through our work in the community, through everything that we do. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand in response. Prayer to God. Lord Jesus, help our praise, help our relationships, help our love, help our ministry of our church, help our families to reflect what you have called us to do, and that's to love one another. Lord Jesus, help us to be reflections of Christ in all that we do. In Christ's name I pray, amen.